Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Felicity Huntingford, and as chair of this session, I'd like to welcome you to the second talk in the Royal Philosophical Society of Glasgow series of lectures for 2020-2021. It's a great pleasure uh, to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Mary Fraser. Uh, Mary's had a really interesting career. She trained as a nurse in the 1960s and worked full-time as a nurse until 1982, when she gained a psychology degree uh, part-time while working full-time as a nurse. And with her degree, at this point, she moved into higher education, um, setting up one of the first degrees for registered nurses in the UK. She subsequently gained a PhD from Goldsmith College London, also part-time, um, uh, on the work of, of the French philosopher and social theorist, Michel Foucault. Uh, Mary continued working, has continued working to promote career paths for nurses and promoting good governance in public health in the UK in various roles. And she held a post as senior lecturer in the University of Strathclyde's Department of Governance and is currently uh, an associate member of their, um, I can never remember what it's called, their, their center for, um, Mary, I'm sorry, the, the, the Center for, for, for Criminology and, and, Social Ju and Criminal Justice. Um, her research has, for the past 10 years has focused on uh, the history of policing in the UK, especially in the early 20th century. And last year she published her latest book, um, which is called um, Policing the Home Front, The Control of British Population at War. And this is a fascinating book. It's, it's really interesting in itself. And it's also interesting because it touches on many topics that are of great pertinence for, to us in, in today's pandemic uh, induced dilemma that we live in. So at that point, I would like to uh, hand over the microphone to Mary and we'll ask her to give her lecture on Britain's police and food supply in World War I. Mary. Thank you very much, Felicity. That was really, really interesting and good. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the, to the RPS for inviting me to um, undertake this lecture, and I'm really pleased to do so. Um, so as Felicity says, for the last 10 to 15 years, I've been developing the history of police work, which is a very underdeveloped area. Um, published work uh, so far on the history of police has been as an institution, and that's been undertaken by Professor Clive Emsley, um, who uh, did his work through the Open University, and also Professor Hayesh Bear Makoff, um, an Israeli uh, researcher, who's shown the makeup of the Metropolitan Police as a labor force. Um, so that's the majority of, of work um, in an academic sense. Historical work by police historians in Britain has also covered things like genealogy. Uh, they're very interested in looking at their family members and, and who, who, who was a policeman and, and where they served. Um, also, there's large collections of memorabilia, such as uniforms and badges and equipment, um, such as truncheons, and there's wonderful displays of, of painted truncheons uh, with the symbols of the uh, forces from which they came. Um, and these form the basis of around 16 uh, police museums around Britain, and also around 10 police collections. There's also a few retired chief constables and senior police officers who've written the histories of their own police force. And unfortunately then, most of the original documents were destroyed. But none of this shows very much of the detail of police work itself, which has barely been addressed. So my current focus is examining police work, particularly during the First World War, because it was a watershed for the police in terms of their work, and also the way in which the service was organized. The primary text I used for, uh, used for this was the popular police journal, 
as it shows the details of how the ordinary policeman talked about his life and work with the problems and daily struggles that he had, as well as the journal promoting how the good policeman should do his job and current national debates. Now I talk in, about policemen and his because the force was all men at that time. It also shows the lives of their incorporated families. In the absence of much other police detailed documentation, much of which has been destroyed, this is one of the best sources I feel. The most widely read of the police journals in World War I was the journal called the Police Review and Parade Gossip, which I think is a wonderful title for a journal. And this is the front page of their, uh, their issue on the 15th of November, uh, 1918, the first week after the armistice. The journal was set up by the philanthropist John Kempster, who wanted the police to develop a more professional image by seeing policing as a career with promotion prospects. He encouraged self-education and in fact, much of the, um, many of the pages in the journal were to do with basic numeracy and literacy for the police, how to write reports and this sort of thing. And he encouraged self-education to improve their self-image. The journal also had a major role in giving the ordinary policeman on the beat a voice at a time when the Home Office and individual senior police officers fiercely resisted police unionization. While many chief, uh, chief constables ruled their force with strict discipline, in fact, many of them were army personnel, um, including, uh, which included forbidding them to request increases in pay during a period of steep food price inflation and also restricting time off at a time of severe staff shortages during World War I, where many of the young police officers had been recruited into the war. The journal also developed a campaigning role. For example, in 1915, it put pressure on the police authorities to implement legislation, which gave policemen one day off in seven, which had been agreed in 1910 but many forces had still not implemented it by mid-war. And this was often because it was considered that it would be an increase on the rates if the number of police officers were increased. So about um, uh, the legislation, the journal surveyed all police authorities, asking about loss of annual leave and time off, and whether payment was made in lieu and whether a war bonus had been granted with the amount. And it named in shame those who hadn't replied by a certain date. And it also um, published the results in late 1915, which named and shamed individual forces who hadn't implemented the one day off in seven. So the journal also gave a voice to police wives who often wrote about um, wrote to the journal complaining of hardship, particularly during the war. So my data collection of the um, police review uh, journal started at the police college library in Tully Allen, where I was granted access. And then I moved to the National Archives at Kew and included uh, as well, all well-reviewed published material and other national and private sources. So this is quite a rounded view of what was happening at the time, although I focus mainly on the police wives. A lot of what I'm going to say was a nationwide issue. The history of the work of the police can't be undertaken without considering their families as well. As most police wives, whether living in urban or rural areas, had the role of the incorporated wife. And this is how the incorporated wife has been described. The discourse of the incorporated wife shows her being portrayed as in the organization, but not part of it. It was her duty to represent her husband and police values, both inside and outside the organization. In so doing, she was a reflection of the pub public image of her husband's occupation and status. 
so that su the success in her role of supporting her husband was aligned with his chances of promotion rather than giving her any recognition in her own right. Her suitability reflected on him. Conversely, non-conformity in the role affected her husband's promotion prospects and Young shows this with one wife who refused to abandon her job as a teacher. The restrictions placed on policemen by their job and the discipline expected by the police as an organization was said to turn both them and their wives inwards. For the wife, this was towards other police wives. Where police families live close together, there was an inward looking self-containment amongst the wives. This reflected their husband's role as a policeman in which he sought to control and order the society around him and needed social distance in order not to be seen as fallible. Although their role was unstated, the police wives were well aware of their place and what was required of them, particularly what they could and couldn't do to be acceptable. The police re review and parade gossip, which I'll uh, talk about in future as just as the police review, exploited this inward looking nature of police wives and its impact on the police family's children by publishing a column for wives in which many made contributions. And it was known not surprisingly as the wives column. And this often occupied two, pay, two columns in um, a four column page. So it was quite a significant um, item. The wives column was published before 1914, but more frequently in wartime as food shortages and other matters that affected the police family became more critical. The wives column included items involving the police home, such as bringing up the children, recipes, and setting the standard for the policeman and his family to be an example in the community. However, these rates of pay to be able to afford the standard setting were a constant source of worry and discussion with amounts granted to each police force openly disclo disclosed through their journal. And at this time, each police force had its own rates of pay. The national rates of pay didn't come in until after 1918 through the Desborough Report, which was published in 1919. So as the breadwinner of the patriarchal police family, Rates of pay were an issue that caused disquiet in the police and escalated uh, significantly during the war with a huge inflation in food prices to culminate in one of the major issues in the Metropolitan Police strike of August 1918 when the war was not yet over. And I'll return to uh, the issues in the Metropolitan Police strike um, later on. The wives struggled to feed their families turned inwards to other police wives, as, as I mentioned. Even before the war, budgets in the lower grades were portrayed as tight. And this is um, about three weeks before the start of the war. So um, these were basic items, food items and other items for middle and lower income families at this time. As the slide, uh, slide shows, the family had five children. The police authorities were well aware that police pay in the lower grades was poor and the implications that a large increase would have on the rate payers. Therefore, they tended to recruit men with smaller families. During the war, whereas expenditure on rent, fuel and clothing remained relatively unchanged, food prices soared. In 1915, the wives column of the police review asked its readers to provide their costs for standard food and household items from the previous July 1914, compared with July 1915. And this was just 11 months into the war. And the results were printed from London and Bristol. 
so that in both cities, even 11 months after the, uh, into the war, there were increases of between two and two and a half percent on the cost of basic, basic items, acknowledged to be around twice the amount of the war bonus, which was given to all local authority employees. So that diets had already started to change. For example, previous routine items such as eating meat every day had come to be considered as luxuries in the diet and were eaten less often. On a national level, by February 1915, Arthur Henderson, Labour MP for Barnard Castle and President of the Board of Education and a member of the cabinet, along with other MPs, were, were pressing Prime Minister Asquith to speed up the Cabinet Commission inquiry, Committee inquiry into the price of food and other staple commodities. As price rises had been modest from the turn of the century to the start of the war, these levels of price increases for basic food items caused alarm. The police review encouraged the incorporated wives to submit items for the wives column and promised to increase the frequency of the column if sufficient text was received. They began publishing weekly menus with associated cost of foodstuffs in October 1915, as well as recipes. By mid 1915, the column showed uh, that economizing was necessary in all areas. The wives recognized that fruit and vegetables were the only items not to have increased in price. One wife wrote that on 35 shillings a week, which uh, in today's values is a, around 135 pounds a week, this doesn't leave much over after five or six people have been fed. During 1916, the column recommended booklets for housewives advocating cut price menus, and these were a couple of the um, recommendations. And later, it also recommended this Win the War cookery book, um, which was quite a substantial publication. It was over 20 pages long. And at the beginning, there were menus with meat. And at the back, it was all uh, about half of it was about um, vegetarian menus. So some, uh, some people advocated vegetarian menus to cut costs unlike today as a lifestyle choice. But meat for the fat for the policeman was seen to be needed to supply his body with the energy required for his active life on the beat. While um, the police review published this about the way in which um, a woman uh, should consider her own requirements. So happily a woman's interior economy can be kept going on an even more restricted diet than that suggested. Um, and the fact that the journal published this indicates that it was the sort of way in which wives should consider themselves. So portraying the good wife as going without some food items or amounts of food in order to support her husband's work. And this was a well-known phenomenon for wives, particularly among working class households where budgets were tight. As almost all policemen at this time came from the working classes, this would be a normal way for them to economize. At the end of April, 1916, the wives co column published the Board of Trade Labor Gazette's figures showing increases in almost every item. This showed rises in the cost of living since the start of the war. There's more than 40% in small towns and villages and over 50% in large towns. But as potatoes showed the smallest rise of around 10%, they became more central to the diet in homes trying to economize. The column compared these increased prices to the average price in the policeman's take home pay of 15 to 
And the column gave um, quite a large number of items and I've just chosen a few to show here with a range of, of the increases. However, despite this, worse was to come. 1916 saw a poor harvest worldwide and Prime Minister Lloyd George told of lower cereal harvests in America, Canada and Argentina by around 40 million tons compared with the previous year. He told Parliament that this was disastrous for the traditional export of any surplus to overseas countries. At this time, Britain was reliant on overseas wheat for around 80% of consumption, as well as relying on imports of concentrated cattle feed and other food commodities. The 1916 wheat harvest in Britain also fell by 400,000 tonnes. Coupled with this, sowing winter wheat for the following year had become more difficult and had decreased due to the shortage of farm labour, many of whom had been recruited into the war, and also the very poor weather conditions for that winter. The weather conditions during 1916 harvest also affected the British potato crop. And we'll, we've talked previously about how important potatoes were to the diet. And the potatoes were seen to, said to be small and diseased and rotted in the ground when the clamps were undone, causing a potato famine. Although some accused farmers of withdrawing potatoes from sale due to government price fixing, which left them without any sort of um, uh, surplus. Not only was there a worldwide shortage of wheat, but around a third of shipping, which brought commodities to Britain, had to be diverted to transport troops, munitions and supplies to France and other troop destinations. While Germany's unrestricted submarine warfare from February 1917 sank an increasing number of cargo ships, bringing food imports to Britain. Both these factors further increased food shortages and added to price rises. Lloyd George restricted imports of some items, and these are just a few that he told Parliament about, and he appealed to the House of Commons that the nation must be called upon to make real sacrifices in the production and distribution of food, which must be equally spread across all classes and income groups. And it was particularly the lack of um, spread between income groups, which was a source of outrage at the time when the press published um, the lavish diets that were eaten by the rich at places like the Ritz, where the um, lower classes couldn't even get um, butter and, and sugar. The, source, the shortage of wheat led the government's food controller to attempt voluntary restrictions on the consumption of bread. And this was a well, um, well circulated um, poster at the time. So bread and potatoes were two of the staples in the diets of the working class families. In some poorer families in Scotland, diets consisted almost entirely of bread, potatoes and tea. Indeed, it was said that the food shortages and inequalities in distribution that led to labour unrest and resulted in the Commission of Inquiry into Industrial Unrest, which reported in mid-1917. In March 1917, the um, police review published this. For all practical purposes, police wives acknowledged that potatoes in the family's diet would be absent until at least the harvest of 1917. And this was a national issue. There weren't potatoes to be found anywhere for, um, from about February to July. The potato famine, as it was called, remove potatoes from the diet, uh, as I say, between February and July, 1917. So at this time, the food supply on the home front in Britain 
1917 was in crisis. January 1917 saw the publication of further steep price rises published by the Board of Trade Labour Gazette. Rises when compared with July 1914 showed 42% increase with the greatest increase occurring in October 1916 of 10% in that month alone. In which month there were increases of uh, between five and 10% in the prices of a number of items, including flour, bread, milk, butter, and cheese. And the largest increases coming in fish, eggs, and potatoes. Bearing in mind that the police wives were not allowed to work outside them to supplement the family income, as this would damage their husband's career prospects and his consequential improvement in the family lifestyle, the portrayal of hardship in January 1917 was such that the wives' column began to print ways of supplementing the family income by working from home. Compared with police wives, many women throughout Britain were working outside the home at this time, often earning good money in munitions and other factories and workshops, which helped them to offset some of the price rises. The police journal recommended keeping poultry and selling the eggs as a favorite method and provided advice on how to go about it, space. And for those with no outdoor space, needlework was recommended. The need to economize on food continued to dominate the wives column. Mid-February 1917 saw mention of the effects of the food controller by setting limits on the consumption of bread, meat and sugar. This led the police review to ask its readers to suggest substitutes. The journal again advised booklets for meatless menus, implying a sense of deprivation and gave a recipe for Irish potato pudding, which would have been before uh, the main um, famine in potatoes and advice on how to prepare split peas. Further suggestions involved using oats instead of flour for cakes and biscuits and making pancakes without eggs. From the end of March, with the absence of potatoes, recipes contain no sign of either meat or potatoes. Recipes were for such things as rice and pea cake, cabbage stuffed with rice and curried vegetables. At a national level, from late December 1916, Lord George urged, urged an urgent increase in home food production, which he said was essential to avoid starvation at home, which was already being seen in, to occur in Germany. He appointed Roland Prothero in late December 1916 as the Minister for Agriculture. And he later became Lord Only, and his books on uh, agriculture during the war are still uh, important texts. He set up the Food Production Department in January 1917 under Sir Arthur Lee to encourage farmers so that Britain could become more self-sufficient, particularly in grain and potatoes. By, uh, and what the um, Food Production Department did was to supply farmers with labor, and this was particularly important to replace those who'd gone to war, numerous uh, farm laborers, laborers who'd gone to war, but also to supply farmers with fertilizers, farm implements and seed and other things that they needed. The food production department was very effective as by the harvest of 1917, uh, I'll show you the output, increase in output in a few minutes. And this was within just seven months. As potatoes by this time were almost unavailable, we're talking now about March, April, drastic measures to feed the nation at home were needed. Advice was to substitute eating bread and potatoes for Swedes and mangle wurzels. Now mangle wurzels are currently known as fodder beet. And here's a field of them, which I um, photographed in Beamish, the outdoor museum in the north of England. 
Um, and this is usually used as cattle feed and is said to be very unpalatable. And this was advocated along with Swedes because it was said to be plentiful and inexpensive. And because mango wurzels were so unpalatable, the Food Controller's Office experimented with recipes to improve its palatability. And this was one of four recipes that was printed um, in the wives column on the 20th of April. So in the interests of historical research, I obtained one of these from a father in, farmer in Lothian uh, just recently in the last couple of weeks. And my husband and I had a meal of it last week. And this is what it looked like. In actual fact, it wasn't bad. <laughs> it was a bit fibrous and we did cheat by having some meat with it. Um, but the taste was not unpleasant. I mean, it tasted somewhat sweet. So the incorporated police household also included the children. The children's column encouraged the children of police families to focus on sharing the, food, the family's food burden. July 1917 saw a competition asking them to submit an essay on how they had changed their diet. And this is what was the winning entry. And she said she was eating a third less bread and a little less cake and pastry to help to preserve flour. She'd also signed the food pledge at school so that this was similar to other children around Britain. And of course, what this did was to shame other family members to eat likewise, as voluntary restrictions were really not very popular and so mainly ignored where it was possible to obtain supplies. Despite government attempts to increase home food production, distribution was not controlled until very late on in the war, leading to food queues, particularly for bread, sugar, meat, butter, and margarine, which started to develop in October, 1917. And by November in, in that year, 1917, were such in London that the police had to be brought in to supervise them. By late December, mid to late December, over 500,000 people were reported to be queuing in London on a Saturday morning with daily reports to the Metropolitan Police Commissioner in order that the queues could be regulated. And similar queues were seen nationwide as I've shown here with this queue in Reading. The issue was that it wasn't just one member of the family that went to queue. Um, numerous members of the family who were old enough were sent out to be in different queues for the same item in case by the time someone got to the front of the queue, the um, provision had run out that they were queuing for. And this was partly why the queues were so huge. However, by the harvest of 1917, a national transformation was seen in the food supply said to be due to the policy of home food production and government action through defense of the Realm Act regulations 2L and 2M and the Corn Production Bill, including increases, increased farm mechanization. And the yield in that year, um, uh, the 1917 harvest was said to increase by this amount. In fact, um, the harvest of 1917 showed that there was a glut of potatoes um, because so many people, so many farmers had planted them. And also there were um, potato planting on allotments, which I'll come to in a minute. So this was said to give hope to the population for increased home food production in the following year, particularly in grain and potato products and to ensure the supply of breadstuffs and potatoes were maintained, regardless of shortages in other food. However, by December 1917, food prices were continuing to rise. The Police Review published a question in the House of Commons, which showed the extent of these rises and how most of the population had had to change their dietary habits to minimize the increases. <clears throat> 
So even when dietary changes had been made, increases were around 90% uh, compared to pre-war. Food price rises and shortages for one of the reasons for 1917 being talked about as the year of war weariness. Local food rationing of sugar, butter and margarine started in December 1917 and became nationwide in early 1918 in a national rationing scheme, which included many of the staple foods. By this time, it was essential as the food queues had, start, had risen dramatically, as I've, as I've just mentioned. Food rationing made an immediate effect as the food queues disappeared overnight with scarce items uh, were distributed more evenly across Britain and everybody felt that they could be sure of receiving their fair share of the produce. Control of the food supply also attempted to prevent hoarding in which the police were involved in searching premises, accompanying food controllers, uh, food inspectors employed by the local authorities. By the harvest of 1918, home food production showed increased acreage of corn, potatoes and pulses. So this is the following year. Um, although spring 1918 saw a further increase in the winter wheat crop of 45% over the previous year, production and an increased acreage under corn and potatoes uh, planted in England and Wales was more than 2 million acres more than in 1916. But the cost of food was still on average 108% dearer than in July 1914. And this was dis despite the government bread subsidy, because the government were determined that at least bread would be available to everybody. The portrayal of hope that the nation would not starve was given in spring 1918 when the government made it known that Britain as a whole had one of the highest increased acreages of wheat and barley since 1888. The highest crop of oats ever recorded and the highest acreage of potatoes since 1872. The interim report of the Director General of Food Production for England and Wales showed the results of the 1917-18 food production campaign had been very successful, with thousands more acres of wheat, potatoes, oats, rye, corn, pulses and barley planted, compared with previous years since the start of the war. The figures for 1918 harvest didn't include the considerable part played by more than 20,000 acres turned over to growing vegetables on allotments, with nearly one and a half million allotments worked by townspeople. And it was also interesting how um, Lloyd George um, was publicized as growing potatoes in his front garden. And the King and Queen were also um, seen to turn part of Windsor Castle uh, grounds over to um, growing vegetables. Furthermore, using scientific formulae, the government investigations into calorific values of foodstuffs compared with the male body's requirements show that despite the hardships, the UK average male calorific intake only diminished by a very small extent. So only by about 3% compared to pre-war. So by this time, the problem was framed more as one of distribution than actual shortage. Britain's programme of self-sufficiency uh, self largely prevented the food riots seen in other combatant nations, such as Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. Although there were some quite unpleasant scenes in some parts of Britain because of, of food shortages. For example, in Wrexham, a wagon load of potatoes arrived in the market and was seized upon by hordes of people climbing onto the wagon and fighting with each other uh, to get hold of the potatoes. Despite this increase in food, 
particularly the Metropolitan Police, were demoralized, exhausted, tired of the autocratic way they were treated, with their requests being ignored and unmet, and desperately poorly paid. One said that he was paid less than band boys and slips of girls. With continuing questions about increases in their pay in the House of Commons during July and early August 1918. So, in desperation, on the 30th of August, they went on strike and marched on Whitehall, and they received an instant pay increase from Lloyd George. And it was interesting how the local population, when they marched down Whitehall, were seen to support them. They obviously realized that. Um, they did have a real issue. So, in conclusion, the discourse of the incorporated police wife saw the pressure on her and her husband to adopt police values. This would determine the lifestyle for the whole family. All her energies must go into the role of the police wife and deviations were strenuously denied, dealt with by the institutional threats to her husband's advancement in his chosen career, with the associated improvement in the family's standard of living and social advancement. To be successful in this role, she strongly aligned herself with other police wives by looking inwards for support and guidance. In this, she was supported by the police journal, the police review. However, particularly in wartime, there was increased hardships for the family in which the good incorporated wife would go without to enable better food production for her husband and probably children as well, as police pay was not seen to keep pace with the highly inflationary costs of all foods. As many women in Britain were employed and receiving a wage or salary, police families portrayed themselves as amongst those that suffered the most. Police pay was one of the sources of in, was the only source of income unless the family had private means. As the good incorporated wife was not allowed to work outside the home, unlike many other women in Britain, to control these inflationary pressures on the family. Family diets altered dramatically during the war, due not only to inflation, but also to availability of staple items such as bread and potatoes. There was also little support nationally for increases in police pay, as others on the home front were in a similar situation and an increase would have meant a rise in the rates. These pressures were a major factor which led to the mounting discontent in the police forces culminating in the Metropolitan Police strike of the 30th of August, which lasted for two days. So thank you, I think I'll, I'll finish that. And um, if you have questions, then I'd be very pleased to try and answer them. Mary, thank you very much. That was really interesting. I've got a whole list of questions and I see that, <laughs> that questions are, 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 are stacking up in the question and answer. So uh, we've got a long list of questions here. So um, I'll start asking them. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. Thanks. Okay. Um, I'm going to go, they've been organised by the number of people who've done a thumbs up to them. So I'll work down that, that, that some of them I think could be linked, but we'll see how it goes. So, okay. um, um, so the first question um, that a number of people have asked or are interested in is that you mentioned that police chiefs tended to come from the military. And yes. the question is whether the lower ranks were also likely to come from the military. And, and did the composition of the force change much during the war? Right, well, thank you. Um, yes, the higher ranks, um, as I mentioned, the chief constables often came from the military, but no, the lower ranks, there were very few that came from the military. Um, if you look at one of the main sources that I looked at, which I found fascinating, was in the Mitchell Library in the archive. Um, you can find the personnel records of the police from around 1800, mid-1800s. Um, and you can see that it shows uh, not only their name and date of birth, but also what their previous occupation was 
um, because only one that I found who was working in 1917 actually came directly from school. So almost all the police um, had um, previous occupations. And what you can see is that many of them were very lowly. So, um, you know, farm servants, farm laborers, um, road workmen, um, you know, very lowly occupations. And so one of the reasons that they went into the police was to improve their self and their um, improvement in their social conditions and their pay. Um, and also they would at that time, um, many of them might have well been on temporary work. So the police was, you know, permanent work with a regular, uh, regular salary. Um, and so being a policeman was very much social advancement. And this was why the police review found it important to teach basic numeracy and literacy skills to, to the police force itself. So they could go to court and um, they could submit reports in uh, ways that were um, acceptable for those that they were talking to. And presumably then, that didn't change much during the, that, since they weren't mostly military people, that source of recruitment into the police didn't change very much during the war? It didn't change at all during the war, okay. no. Um, and apart from the archives in, in Glasgow, um, the piece of work that was conducted by Hesh Bayer Makoff um, shows that this was a similar trend in the Metropolitan Police. So one might assume that most police forces were composed of similar sort of people. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, there are a lot of people have a question about, they want to know when were the police allowed to become unionized and able to strike? Ah, right. Well, this um, unionization arose um, during the war because of the hard conditions and because many workers um, were unionized and strikes were quite prevalent, as I'm sure you know, on Clydeside and other places. Um, so the police felt that they should have a voice. Um, but those who were known to be members um, were either dismissed or were given. I mean, it was one of the reasons that there was disquiet in the police, that they were felt sometimes that union members were sent to war rather than people who weren't union members at a time when people, the men didn't want to go to war. The novelty of going to war had worn off. This was from 1916 onwards or 1915, when voluntary recruitment was no longer um, the way in which the army was made up. Um, so, you know, unionization, although the police desperately wanted um, their voices to be heard, uh, they were harshly treated if they were found to be a member of a union. And this was partly why the, Des the Desborough Report of 1919 set up the Police Foundation, the Police Federation and Foundation, um, to cater for the, um, the input of the policemen on the beat to be a voice for them. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, there are enough people would like to know, given those remarkable figures you showed us about the, the, the lack of, food, whether there was evidence of adverse health effects. I, I know oh, yeah. there was a, um, from poor, poorer nutrition due to the reduction in available foods and the reliance on, on just staples. Mm. Mm. I would say but, particularly for the wives. Yes, indeed. I mean, one of the main sources is beverage. Now, beverage is written about um, the uh, wartime situation and on, on the population. And he didn't give indications that there were health effects um, from a poor diet. Because the calorific uh, level was maintained, he said that second-class protein would have been sufficient through vegetables 
um, and milk, milk was never um, a problem. Milk wasn't rationed, milk wasn't, uh, I mean, there was a decrease in the amount of milk, but it wasn't ever uh, got to the level of shortages. So these sorts of things probably would have provided the protein um, and the carbohydrates would have come from such things as fruit and vegetables and bread. Now bread was very interesting because the government was determined that bread supply would continue above everything else. And um, what they did was to um, increase the extraction rate at the mills of the grain. So before the war, extraction rate was about 95%. And by pushing the rollers closer together, they gradually got 97% um, extraction rates. So this helped to offset the shortage of grain. And also um, what they did um, little by little was to include other products. So you had rye grain and you had um, other, other sorts of grain, barley put into the, um, into the bread. And eventually when potatoes were plentiful, potatoes would be put into it as well. So this, this although it, bread was supplied, it changed the consistency of bread. So as one person put it, they became like uh, the consistency of a howitzer shell. <laughs> um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but at least they were there. Yes. But the other thing that um, the government did, which also I found really quite interesting, was that they prevented the sale of bread for 24 hours after it was baked. <laughs> so it became less Moorish. Yes. So people would eat less of it. Um, yes. So all this maintained the supply. And the government eventually put in subsidies um, to bread to maintain the supply. So, so on that subject, another question is whether lessons had been learned in time for World War II about right. police pay and conditions and also about national self-sufficiency in food yes. productions. Were, were lessons learned? Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. And it was seen that particularly people like women didn't come in to um, agriculture for quite some time the Women's Land Army really didn't start to get going until mid to late 1917. And by the Second World War, of course, they were still, uh, you know, the training schools were there and the training for um, other groups to be involved in agriculture was already learned in the First World War. Um, and yes, by that time, the police had a national pay scale and um, they were directly responsible to the Home Office. So, you know, the police were then nationalized and, you know, had a central um, point of contact. Okay. Now, um, a number of people want to know whether the mainstream media picked up on the police review and parade gossips concerns on pay and whether that was, and, and if, and whether there was, sympathy for, for the police arguments for more pay in the local communities. Right, thank you. Well, this was quite a mixed picture. I mean, there was a story in the police review about um, a question about increase in police pay in Hove. And apparently there were guffaws of laughter about requests for police pay because they were finding it really hard to manage. And the, um, many of the councillors said, good heavens, you know, everybody's having this problem. It's not just the police. So that was completely undermined in, in Hove. Other places, um, they had more sympathy, um, but it, re it was raised constantly in the House of Commons, particularly in mid to late um, 1918. Um, particularly for the Metropolitan Police, as I mentioned. But generally, there was, there was one um, notable example of the Chief Constable of um, Oxford 
who regulated and made um, made uh, remonstrations to the uh, police authorities on behalf of the police pay. And this was gauged to the increase in the price of bread. So he had a very uh, modern, by our own standards, uh, comparator to be able to ask for increases in pay. But many of the other chief constables, because of their military background, and because, of course, they were paid reasonably well, wow. uh, didn't see what the problem was. So, uh, so I wouldn't I allow the, um, uh, the, uh, chief, the constables to actually put forward their point of view to the police authorities. It, it, it's amazing. Now, I know there's a question further down the list, which I read earlier, about uh, was it the case that everybody was in, that the police were in the same basket with their or other workers when it came to hardship during the World War, or, or, or were they particularly, did they have particular problems because their wives couldn't work? I find this difficult to quite know. Um, I think it was because there was the single paycheck coming in that made it worse for them. But you hear about a lot of the women working in munitions factories and other workshops and, and um, uh, factories um, who were earning very good money. And you saw them going out and buying extravagant clothes and, um, you know, furn new furniture. The furniture shops were um, making a great living because of the amount of money that um, otherwise were earning. So I don't quite know. There must have been other groups, I think, where the wives weren't allowed to work, mm. particularly as they were. The police were claiming to be middle class. This was one reason why the men went into the police to increase their social standing. So they claimed to be middle class. And of course, at that time, middle class women didn't work. Yes. Um, and it had to be encouraged. Lloyd George had to encourage um, women to actually take mm. on work, um, mm. particularly when it got to 1917, when so many men had gone to war. OK, can I then ask on behalf of a, some of, of our audience, when were women police officers first employed and where? Ah, oh, no, that's an interesting question. Um, women were not employed in the police force as such. They had separate organizations in the First World War. And there were two organizations who were voluntarily, uh, or most of them uh, women worked on a voluntary basis. And they set up schools for policing for women, but they were never really considered part of the police force. They had their own uniforms and they were mainly responsible for women and children. The typical woman's role of, of being in charge, uh, responsible for women and children. Um, but the police vehemently refused to accept them on their own terms. So, for example, very few of them were sworn in. And if you're not sworn in, you can't make an arrest. Okay. Um, and this, of course, is a chief, one of the chief functions of the police is to be able to arrest people. Um, but the women police um, were very persistent. Um, you know, they, they um, eventually were used in places like the munitions factories where a lot of single girls were put in hostels working away from home so as to give them you know moral uh, moral guidance um, because of the risk of, of you know these young single women uh, being on their own um, so that was a major source of employment for women police they were also employed largely on the streets um, supervising uh, in case of moral corruption uh, there was the fear of the spread of venereal disease through the throughout the country and particularly to the troops and the women police were there seemed to be advising the young girls um, who saw that khaki was particularly attractive and would sort of flood around the um, uh, the, the barracks um, in the hope of attracting um, a, a soldier. 
And this was a major source of concern for the, for the male policemen to know quite how to deal with this. So the women police came into their own in that respect as well. But come the end of the war, those who, despite um, the representations by the women police, the ones who were employed looking after the girls in the munitions factories were made redundant. So hundreds of them were made redundant um, because there was seen to be no will for them. And in fact, the Home Office actually said, you can see letters in, in the National Archives at Kew, saying that because they had such a limited role, which was really all they were allowed to do, was to be um, responsible for women and children, because they had such a limited role, um, there really was no future for them. Okay. <laughs> From one depressing question to another. Um, so they came into their own much later on between the wars. Okay, so here's another depressing question. Um, <laughs> um, can you hear me? It's, yes. Yes, sorry. Um, so, so a number of people want to know, do you think there are any lessons for the current government based on this research on how to manage possible post Brexit related disruption to food supply next year? Oh, goodness, that's an interesting question, isn't it? Yes, yes. I'll tell, yes. tell you how I would answer that. And this is something that I've noticed just recently, is that the police consider themselves to be a family. And they always have done. The police as a family in World War I was to do with including the wives and the children. Now that wives and, uh, you know, are, are frequently working outside the home, uh, and have their own careers. Still the idea of police as um, a family is very prevalent. And I don't know whether you remember a short while ago when one, a policeman was killed and Cressida Dick talked about uh, the police being so upset because he was one of our family. And what this means is that the idea of the family and the police has changed. And it means that now that um, the police are, um, the police find it uh, very comforting and very reassuring to have other people in the police force as their family. Um, so all of them, are considered family members and work closely together and, you know, uh, in harmony. Um, on the other hand, you can see that um, some families are a mechanism for social control. And the police have always been, um, have stated that they have autonomy. Um, and therefore, if, one member of the police force is seen to step out of line. If they're members of a family, that's quickly picked up and they can be dealt with um, accordingly um, without the intervention of other groups. So in a way, the, um, the monitoring of um, people, uh, you know, with, with COVID, um, has to be seen to be, the police have always relied on um, public support. Mm -hmm. So I now feel a bit sorry for the policemen in Manchester because I wonder how they will cope with the current situation in Manchester where clearly um, they may well be asked to supervise the population and some of them will come from the local population. And so will they lose public support? Well, that's a difficult thing to know. They, they simply can't function without public support. So I think those are the two points I'd make. Thank you. Um, was this, where was civil unrest seen um, in, during the First World War over food shortages? Where, where did it, well, was there civil unrest and what form did it take? Well, there's a very interesting example in Glasgow, in George Square. Um, the women um, from the housing associations 
um, gathered in George Square because they wanted to have a deputation to the council to say how difficult it was for them. How were they going to feed their families without potatoes? Mm -hmm. And um, the corporation voted down their deputation. And they were furious because what they heard the, I mean, you can see this in, in the Glasgow Herald, um, the provost said that they'd be better off going home and looking after their children rather than protesting in George Square. Yeah. So, of course, they were utterly furious. And this created um, a, uh, a struggle, actually, in the council chambers itself, where four members of the council, uh, the council uh, were ejected from the meeting. And they went outside and talked to the women in George Square um, about how they tried to get their um, deputation heard the following week. Um, but in fact, nothing came of this. And the, the women continued to demonstrate. They had a meeting on uh, Glasgow Green. Um, they had a protest march um, from, um, I think, a short distance um, from in, in Glasgow to George Square. Um, and this was seen to be a real issue for them. And of course, their, their husbands um, sympathized dramatically with them because they weren't getting potatoes either or, or being fed appropriately. Um, so this was seen on our doorstep. Um, but also there were strikes of miners when they felt that they um, were not receiving appropriate pay. In Norfolk, for example, um, which is um, a grain growing area, mm -hmm. um, the um, farm workers, farm laborers went on strike because the price of food rose and their pay didn't increase. Um, you see the, the shipbuilding, uh, shipbuilders going on strike mm. um, because of uh, food prices and also because they had to work such huge increased hours over time to actually combat the food mm. price rises. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a very difficult time for the government um, to cope with all this. Was there evidence as that the population was actually healthier during the war restrictions because of eating, you know, less meat, less rich food? That's an interesting question. I really am not entirely sure. I mean, one thing that the um, food, uh, food, um, food production department said was that they were horrified at the lack of skill of the women of being able to cook vegetables. Oh. So um, canteens, national kitchens were set up and the government subsidized local authorities for um, to set up one of these in their local authority and numerous ones were set up. This was 1917. Mm -hmm. um, and they experimented with recipes and they were also um, only set up on condition that they didn't look like soup kitchens. So in other words, they weren't, oh, only, yeah. they weren't only um, for the working classes. They would encourage the middle class people, those that work for councils and what have you, um, to actually go and use their facilities during the day. And they were hugely successful. Okay. You, you told us about one recipe that you tried. I mean, were there any <laughs> others? <laughs> the, the, were there any others? Have you tried any others? Any that you'd particularly recommend? Well, I've, put, <laughs> I've still got three quarters of a mangel wurzel in the fridge. <laughs> so I'm intending to try another one, um, Match, probably uh, later in the week. <laughs> I, I was about to say, if I were you, I'd leave it there. <laughs> um, but actually, it looked very nice on your flowery plate, I must say. Um, um, there's a question, a very serious question here. Uh, saying that uh, not much has changed in terms of the, the conditions and service of police and a policeman's lot today. Do you think that privatizing the police force would improve the policeman's lot? Um, oh, okay. Since prisons and armed force units and lots of other things are now privatized, do you think a privatized police force would be better for policemen oh. and women? Goodness. Do you know, I've never really considered that. <laughs> 
there is um, a review of policing going on at the moment, um, to which I've made a very small contribution. And they are looking at every, every aspect of police yeah. work. Yeah. And what they're particularly doing, because like many um, uh, occupational groups, they've moved into higher education. So mm -hmm. degree courses and mm -hmm. higher degrees mm -hmm. for police mm -hmm. are not unusual these days. They've tended to go for um, such things as being able to measure this, that, and the other, mm -hmm. being able to measure their effectiveness. Um, but I've not heard anything about privatization. Um, okay. Maybe I just haven't been a member of the groups where it's been suggested. Okay. But I'm not aware of it. Okay. But yes, I, uh, sorry, it, I should say, yes. I mean, as I understand it, police pay is still um, a serious concern, you know, that they. Yeah they're not particularly the lower grades are not yeah. particularly well paid yeah. and also their level of skill of course have ha has had to dramatically increase yes yes um i have a question about um where when did the role of the incorporated wife begin to diminish is it still there a little bit or has it disappeared altogether as i understand it it's disappeared altogether and when I, did... think, I think it was something um, of its time. I mean, a lot of middle class wives at that time didn't work outside the home and they were there purely for their husbands, the home and the family. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and, and many middle class jobs were able to support that without too much difficulty, I think. Okay. Um, when did it diminish? I suppose in the Second World War, was that still when women were working um, mainly at home? Um, I think that's probably likely. I mean, I remember my father, who was born in 1912, um, was very reluctant to have my mother go out to work. Yeah. I think it was probably a sign of the times. Um, yes, yes. Um, did the suffer? I was uh, another question that's been someone suggested to me is to ask whether, whether the suffragettes movement was interested in 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 the role of police wives in in this um, you know corporate wife problem dilemma for the police um, wife. Yes. Well, of course, the suffragettes abandoned their um, strategies of protest during the war. Yeah. Uh -huh. And they became much more concerned with feeding the families. Yeah. So um, many of them set up uh, cut-priced restaurants in East London, for example, um, and also had um, legal advice for the wives on how to um, claim and get the proper amount of um, war separation allowance, because many of them didn't know how to phrase a letter um, and didn't really know whether they were getting the correct amounts because they changed from time to time. So all these sorts of um, uh, services, uh, the suffragettes tended to set up rather than actually protest at the time for their rights. But would have been supporting them in their dilemma, presumably. Absolutely, yes, yes, yes. yes absolutely. Um, I, I'm really. I, I wanted to ask. Um, I'm really. In, this is coming from me. I'm really interested <laughs> in your in in that in the in the police review as a source of information. Mm. Who who wrote the articles? Who was the editor and who wrote? The articles. The artic the editor um, was this guy called John Kempster. Um, now he was um, a philanthropist, and he believed in um, uh, no alcohol. Um, and he set up this journal uh, at a time when um, the police really needed uh, the sort of um, support. 
that um, they were given through the journal. And he was the editor. Um, now quite where his text came from, I'm really not sure. Because what you see is detailed um, letters sent in and detailed columns uh, from different forces about different aspects of police work during the war. And he must have had people in almost every police force who were sending him copy. Because I can't believe that he would have got it from another source. But the journal was sufficiently influential that if you look at the um, issues to do with the police in Kew, in the um, mm. archives in Kew, you see sections of the police review cut out and stuck into the um, into the pages, showing that you know this is a real issue that government needs to take notice mm -hmm. of. Um, but um, I mean, the wives wrote, uh, mm -hmm. and I think he probably didn't edit too much of what they wrote. Um, there was a letters page, and the letters page was very vociferous about various issues and the more vociferous as the war went on, particularly about who was sent to war and who was who remained at home, um, because it was seen that there was um, unfair um, allocation. It was seen that probably those who were thought not to be behaving appropriately in one way or another were sent to war while the rest remained at home. Um, and, you know, this were very vociferous letters about all this. Um, and they often occupied a complete page. Then there was the education page, which was in almost every week. Um, and excerpts from the House of Commons, um, you know, about questions and yeah. about issues that were asked. So it was quite a comprehensive journal. It's, it feels, besides being amazing, somewhat subversive. Was there ever any um, attempt to shut it down? I mean, I know it did, it did support the status quo in some respects, but a lot of what you've said is quite yeah. subversive. Yes, it is. Yes, absolutely. And it does make you wonder whether there was. I mean, there is no evidence of that that I could find. Um, yeah. And it lasted until 2011. Um, so it lasted since the mid 1800s to 2011. Um, and That's, I don't think even yeah. then it was because yeah. there was um, a lack of um, a copy being sold. I think it was probably because other, other journals came up which were more, um, more popular. By 2011, you're probably into internet issues. Yes. Yes. Um, the last things on the list of questions are, are almost comments. One, one that says, this is very interesting. It appears that it's showing the history of food shortages, but using the police historic records. That, which I agree, it's, a, it's a really amazing that the information is there and the way that you've extracted it um, is, is incredible. Um, oh, thank you. Um, there's also a suggestion sort of to do with the privatization of the police force, the commoditization, commoditization of labor, the Uber model, get a policeman when you need one, for example. So, <laughs> so perhaps, uh, perhaps that. Dial um, a policeman, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, oh, just one more question, and then I think we should stop. Were the contributions anonymous, or where they, where they, where they were attributed, were the mm. consequences for the writers? Right. Now, isn't that interesting? Often they were anonymous, but in some cases they did actually say this is from the Barry police force, for example. Yeah. So the issue that was raised, probably if you really wanted to, you could identify the person that was raising it. Um, if it was a small police force. If it was a larger one, and I mean, Glasgow had nearly 2,000 policemen in the force at the mm. time, so you probably couldn't identify it unless it was very specific who it was that had written it. Okay, but there's no chatter about people getting into trouble because of having written stuff that, that in, in the journal itself? The, the... Not that I came across, no. Okay. No. Well, Okay. 
I think we've probably kept you talking for long <laughs> enough. So I, I, that's been a really interesting discussion and, and it could go on much longer, but I think we'll stop now. And now just before we shut down the cameras and the Zoom, I would like to thank you, Mary, so much for such an interesting and thought-provoking lecture. Um, as, as the coverage was amazing, and you can tell by the question, the range of questions that, that people were really interested in what you were saying. So thank you very much indeed. I, we can't clap, um, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm mentally clapping for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. Thank you.